evening. Hi. Thanks for coming. I'm Tina Wadowski and I'm director of the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare. I'm hoping that there are people who weren't locked out and trying to get in a few minutes ago because this door um, closes electronically and um, I, if you have someone texting you to open the door um, or hope or text your friends if you know that they're coming so that you'll open the door for them if they can't get in. Um, it is my pleasure to um, uh, uh, welcome you to this year's FW Prezant Memorial Lecture. Now the Prezant Lecture was established um, in the 90s by um, Professor um, uh, Doug Morrison actually, who was chair of the steering committee for the Campbell Center for um, a number of years. And the, this Memorial Lecture Series is brought to us by the OAC Alumni Foundation, and it allows us to bring um, world-class speakers in every couple of years for um, several days to a week to um, not only present this Memorial Lecture, but to spend a week with us and our students and our faculty and our partners from off campus and the ministry and industry partners. And so it's a wonderful opportunity. So before I introduce uh, Professor Mallard, tonight's speaker, I'd like to first introduce um, um, Anna DeMarshi Myers, who is the president of the OAC Alumni Foundation. And she's going to say a few words about the foundation and about Fred Prezant, who um, this uh, memorial lecture series is named after. Anna? Anna, picture. Huh. There it is. <laughs> so you're probably wondering, who is F.W. Prezant? And I started doing some research, and there's lots of stuff out there. I can't begin to tell you all of his accomplishments. But I'll give you some highlights just to talk about who he was. So he served in World War I as a pilot, and after he finished uh, service, he enrolled at OAC. He's part of class of 1923. So that's quite exciting. Um, upon graduation, he was an extension specialist focusing on vegetable production here at OAC. And then he moved to teach at the Western Ontario Experimental Farm in Bridgetown. And it was about five years after um, graduation where he took a position with Master Feeds at the Toronto Elevators. And he excelled in collaborating with other researchers, um, in focusing on high quality manufacturing techniques, in customer service, something that we need to learn from today, I think. And then he retired as president and director of the company back um, in 1963. But he really was instrumental in driving Masterpiece into the great company it is today. Who had a long and distinguished uh, involvement with the University of Wealth and OAC. Um, he was the chair of the OAC Advisory Board, chair of the Board of Regents of the uh, Federated Colleges and vice president of the Board of Governors. He, was the, he received the Fellow of the University of, um, by the University of Guelph, um, the Alumnus of Honor from the Alumni Association, and the OAC Centennial Medal, and he was also inducted in the Canadian um, Agricultural Hall of Fame. So it's really fitting that the OAC Alumni Foundation supports the Fred Croissant Lecture with other people that have shown foresight and leadership. And uh, we're going to hear about uh, some of the great, exciting work that Professor Mellor has done. And I'm really looking forward to sharing this evening with you. Thank you, Anna. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce Professor David Meller, uh, who is the Foundation Director for the OIE Collaborating Center for Animal Welfare Science and Bioethical Analysis at Massey University in New Zealand. Professor David Meller's professional interests during his last 52 years include the fetus, birth in the newborn, pain and stress assessment and alleviation, livestock slaughter, updating ideas in animal welfare science, and value systems applied to animal welfare. So it's very diverse. He has about 532 publications. Hear that, graduate students? 
<laughs> in these areas, 300 of which are major works, including six books. He's made sustained contributions to understanding animal welfare science throughout the last 36 years and is still very active in these areas. During the last 27 years, David has served on numerous national and international advisory committees, uh, working parties, and other groups. He's also acted as an animal welfare consultant to government departments and other bodies in various countries. He has wide experience integrating scientific, veterinary, industry, consumer, animal welfare, legal, cultural, and other interests during the development of animal welfare standards, regulations, and legislations in New Zealand and internationally. Professor Meller has received a number of awards for his contributions to animal welfare science and the practical management of animal care. He is currently Professor of Applied Physiology and Bioethics, Professor of Animal Welfare Science and Foundation Director of the Animal Welfare Science and Bioethics Center at Massey University in New Zealand, New Zealand, positions he's held since 1998. He has a BSc Honors from New England University in Australia and PhD from University of Edinburgh, Scotland. So it's my pleasure to invite Professor Meller to talk to us tonight about thriving, not surviving. <laughs> I'm just checking to see if this microphone is working. Yep. It is? Yes. Good. You'll have to use this until I find it. Okay. <clears throat> Well, <laughs> in a student assessment a number of years ago, they said it'd be handy if he stood on a box. <laughs> it was an anonymous assessment. <laughs> so I won't stand behind this. Uh, I'll be walking around a bit, and um, so <laughs> I don't know how we'll get on for the, the video, but um, good. Surviving, not merely thri uh, thriving. It's been a long day. Uh, key, uh, key, new keys for unlocking impediments to the enhancement of animal welfare. This is uh, what I've tried to do for quite a while now is to uh, look to the future of uh, animal welfare and see if I could come up with some new conceptual frameworks that assist us going forward and to see if we can capture what the science has been telling us and help us to just sort of keep, uh, keep well up with that. And that's what I'm endeavouring to do uh, today. Now, I, I know you can't read those, um, but uh, if, so, if anyone's interested in a copy of the slides, uh, I can provide PDF copies through Tina um, and I'm quite happy to. Uh, give them to you. Um, in terms of the, uh, the papers, oh, actually you can read them, it's just I can't read them. <laughs> right. okay. uh, in terms of the papers, you can see David Fraser is noted up there. Um, he and colleagues uh, were early in the area of talking about positive experiences as well as negative ones. <clears throat> And uh, uh, James Yates and David Main uh, followed, uh, a pro well, 10 years later. Uh, and then a number of other people have been working in this area and their, their work is summarized in, in my paper and fully referenced. So if you think I'm just sort of into self-aggrandizement, you're right. No, um, <laughs> it's, uh, those are fully referenced and um, they're reasonable sources of that information and they'll give you background to the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Uh, these last three are free downloads from Animals, uh, the journal. So our purpose is for animals to thrive, not merely survive. Um, and what we'll do is we will talk about circumstances that enable them to survive and then we look at what is necessary to enable them to thrive. So we'll talk about freedoms, provisions and welfare aims, then we'll think about the five domains model. Some of you who were here this afternoon, there is a little bit of repetition but not much. Um, and uh, that will help embed it for you, so uh, you'll look forward to hearing that, uh, those elements again. 
And then we'll talk about seven key applications of the model. Uh, the, uh, sorry, then we'll talk, yeah, the five domains model. Then we'll talk about seven key applications of the model and have some concluding comments. So uh, I want to emphasize here under this heading, the five freedoms and the importance of the provisions, which got forgotten. Uh, and then my substitute for the five freedoms. Now quite a few people here will have heard of the five freedoms. Would that be right? Yes, yes, there are hands up everywhere. Um, and uh, so this, these won't surprise you. And you'll notice that they are as two columns. And this is how John Webster uh, actually made them up in Canada when he was in Edmonton, um, which is interesting. Uh, I learned that last... It's an inspirational place. Oh, I know. Canada's absolutely fantastic in terms of animal welfare and the people are so friendly and um, they don't work you hard when you come here as a visitor. And <laughs> it's all right. I volunteered. <laughs> okay. So this was, the, this was the original configuration of the five freedoms. So you have freedoms down the left-hand side and provisions down the right-hand side. So... Just to remind you, freedom from thirst, hunger, and malnutrition um, by providing ready access to fresh water and a diet to maintain full health and vigor. Now, I'm not going to read all of that. Um, but what happened was that when people, uh, the five freedoms have literally been put uh, down on paper probably thousands of times. They're part of legislation around the world. Um, they are in books and they're in scientific papers, and they are in the um, entrance halls of uh, organizations like the RSPCA Australia and um, SPCA in New Zealand and the C Canadian Federation for Animal Welfare, where they're sort of saying, well, we've just got the five freedoms. Why the hell are you throwing them out? <laughs> Which is what I'm doing. Um, so, uh, but for economy's sake, they decided to write them down, instead of having freedoms and provisions, they wrote them down as freedom from this, that, and the other by providing that and that and that, okay? And so the freedoms and the provisions became amalgamated into just the freedoms. And so people thought that they were really uh, emphasizing the freedoms when in fact, if you look at their, uh, is there a word, Ubiqui ubiquity? <laughs> they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. When you look at that, uh, you will see what is emphasized. If you look in codes of welfare, for example, it's the provisions that are emphasized. It's how you manage animals to try and achieve welfare objectives. Now, freedoms from this, that, and the other, the five freedoms were the welfare objectives. Um, but it's just a pity that they're biologically misleading and inaccurate. Um, now, <laughs> I'm going to sugarcoat this, you, you understand. I'll, be very, I'll just sort of sidle into my objections. Um, <laughs> so when John Webster um, uh, formulated them, he did say that it actually means as free as possible from, not completely free from. But... Uh, that sort of got lost in the mist and uh, as animal rights people um, sort of increased in their uh, in interest and influence, they became, to, they increasingly were regarded as rights. You know, freedom, it's like the inalienable rights of uh, human beings um, with regard to the uh, United Nations um, Charter for Human Rights. Um, so the problem with that then is uh, how effectively uh, do they capture things? Now I should say, at the time they were formulated, it was the only thing we had, really. And it was really good because it brought together a whole lot of things. It brought together uh, nutrition, environment, health, and behavior. Um, although the experiences associated with these were a bit mixed up. Um, uh, between the, uh, the different freedoms, but uh, it, re it recognized a much wider dimension to animal welfare than was then understood. And when I first started talking about animal welfare in the very late 80s, early 90s at Massey University, 
um, and asking um, uh, the people in the veterinary school uh, what animal welfare was, um, I actually got the goldfish response. You know what the goldfish response is? Mouth opening and closing and nothing coming out. <laughs> when I mentioned the five freedoms, I was saying, oh, yeah, we're doing that. And so they got a bit more relaxed about it, but they were worried that animal welfare was, uh, as were feder federated farmers in those days, uh, animal welfare was um, the province of middle-aged, cardigan-wearing, cat-owning, super-sensitive females. They say when you have an unpalatable mas uh, message, you should only deliver it when you've got one foot in the stirrup so you can get away. <laughs> Um, I don't think that. <laughs> um, I have never thought that. Uh, but that was the way it was sort of pushed out. And basically it was because people, one, didn't understand its significance, and two, they were threatened by it because they didn't understand it, frankly. Uh, and so the veterinary profession eventually, once they began to understand it and so on, came on board, and they're very much on board today. So one of the... Pro uh, one of the um, issues with the five freedoms is that they are problematic in that uh, you can't be free of most of the things that are enumerated in the five freedoms. In fact, the things that they talk about, or John talked about and others do, did once he'd published it, about what, what animals should be free from if they're going to have good welfare are absolutely essential, the negatives are absolutely essential to experience in order to survive. Thirst and hunger. Without thirst, you won't drink. Without hunger, you won't eat. Without pain, you won't avoid or um, uh, remove yourself very quickly from potentially injuri injurious uh, events and activities uh, that could be fatal, uh, and so on. Um, so given that it was expressed as freedoms and given that it was actually uh, still in some places expressed as the foundations of good welfare management founded on something that one, you can't achieve and two, uh, that is actually biologically misleading in a way that I'll explain in a moment. Um, I've actually uh, wanted to provide uh, an alternative to it. Now, the provisions are what is important. They're in codes of welfare. They represent how we manage animals in order to achieve, achieve whatever welfare aims we may have. And so, um, with that background, oh, I see they're all equally important again. <laughs> These were numbered one to three. Not, <laughs> not. <laughs> This is going from Mac to something else. Um, OK. <laughs> so the provisions have been really influential. The freedoms less so, but people haven't recognized that they've been uh, thinking about the provisions when they were talking about the freedom. Um, because they provide the practical advice for actually managing the welfare of animals. Um, most of the negative experiences in the five freedoms can only be minimized, not eliminated, so you can't be free from them. And uh, the freedoms mostly focused on negative experiences, but now we must also consider positive ones. And here's a, another list of three things that are equally important. So the steps that I sort of recommended and I've published are to avoid reference to the freedoms, to reduce misconceptions and confusion to emphasize the provisions but update them to give attention to negative and positive experiences or states, and then to align each provision with relevant animal welfare aims that emphasize animals' experiences that most affect their welfare. Now, those experiences are the ones that are negative or positive. Neutral experiences like me looking at that gray wall, if it is a gray wall, <laughs> might be a very light green one. Um, that's a subjective experience, but it doesn't particularly worry me or whatever. If I'd been brought up in a prison with that coloured wall and I was looking at that, I might have negative experiences as a result of that memory, but we're not worried about that in terms of uh, animal welfare or mine, really. Okay, so here are the five provisions welfare aims paradigm, or here is the paradigm which I have formulated as a substitute for 
The Five Freedoms, um, published in the uh, last of those papers on the list. Good nutrition, provide ready access to fresh water and a diet to maintain full health and vigor. And those of you who are really alert will notice that that's exactly the same as the first provision in the Five Freedoms. Um, the welfare aims are, however, to minimize thirst and hunger and to enable eating to be a pleasurable experience. Good environment, to provide shade, shelter, or comfort, uh, suitable housing, good air quality, and comfortable resting area. Aims, minimize discomfort and exposure and promote thermal, physical, and other comforts. And there's a whole list of comforts that you'll be able to think, um, access through the five domains model, which we're going to be talking about. Good health. Prevent or rapidly diagnose and treat disease and injury and foster good muscle tone, posture, and cardiorespiratory function. Aims, minimize breathlessness, nausea, pain, and other aversive experiences, and I'll be giving you quite a long list. Um, and promote the pleasures of robustness, vigor, strength, and well-coordinated physical activity. I'm a golfer. <laughs> so, we all know, I'm sure, what it's like to be physical, physically fit, and also what it's like when you're not. And if you think of someone who, uh, of necessity, for whatever reasons, is uh, unable to get exercise and have muscle tone, and we can also think of pigs in sow stalls and so on, where they end up with all sorts of uh, problems in terms of um, uh, muscle wastage and so on, because they can't move around and maintain muscle tone then it gives you an idea of the importance of fitness um, uh, for a sense of well-being. Appropriate behavior, provides sufficient space, proper facilities, congenial company, and appropriately varied conditions with the aims of minimizing threats and unpleasant restrictions on behavior and promoting engagement in rewarding activities. And that leans towards the fifth. Now, some of you who uh, might be really alert um, will notice that good nutrition, good environment, good health, and appropriate behavior happen to be the four main things that the uh, mega euro program of the European welfare quality system came up with as the things to aim for if you're um, wanting to have good welfare. Um, that's not really a coincidence because, as you'll see from the five domains model, which I developed in 1994, nutrition, environment, health, and behavior were the first, first four domains, which I drew out of the five freedoms. But let's be clear, if you're talking about animals, if you're coming from that direction and you're looking about the key features that are important in animals, you'll come with the same sort of thing as you will if you're coming from that direction or that direction or that direction, because it's all going on in animals. And so it's actually quite comforting to see that there is uh, some uniformity and consistency. And then with an emphatic commitment to uh, giving animals opportunities for positive experiences, positive mental experiences provide safe, congenial, and species appropriate opportunities to have pleasurable uh, experiences. And then in general terms, promote various forms of comfort, pleasure, interest, confidence, the sense of control. Now, I, I, after I've sort of written about uh, replacing the five freedoms, um, people in um, Canadian Federation for Humane Societies and the RSPCAs and said, said, oh, look, we've only just got people with the five freedoms. I mean, really, do you, <laughs> do you really need to do this? Um, and uh, it, so sort of concerned were they that I decided to come up with this. And it's, it's a start. Uh, it might be a finish as well. But it's, um, it is certainly uh, my attempt to bring this up to date. I wish I could come up with uh, something a little more catchy than the Fair Provisions Welfare Aims paradigm. I mean, the Five Freedom sounds really good, um, but unfortunately misleading. So now we'll have a look at the five domains. But before we do, I want to emphasize a point. <clears throat> One is, I don't agree with defining animal welfare. 
Some people say, how can you measure something or how can you assess something if you can't define it? Well, the problem with defining something, especially in a field that is actually continuously moving, uh, is that uh, when knowledge changes, you find people get defensive about their, um, their definitions and they uh, try to bend things or disregard things in order to fit in with their definitions. Um, and I don't think it's particularly helpful and to actually go to someone and say the definition of welfare is, um, it's going to be out of date in five years time or ten years time. Um, so my um, uh, approach is to characterize animal welfare in terms of its key features. And if you want to see the characterization of that, that's in the third last of those things on the, on the thing. Section 10, a whole lot of bullet points. And the advantage of that is by going through particular features uh, of uh, key elements of animal welfare, when knowledge changes, you can modify any one or more of those, or you can delete them and add others and so on. So you can actually keep it up to date. And I think that's quite important, and it's important for those who are working in this field, to, when they're, especially when they're engaging in interactions with those who are receiving the uh, end product, which is uh, welfare codes and welfare advice and so on, to recognize that our understanding of animal welfare is growing, and at any one time we are talking about how we understand it now, recognizing that it will our understanding will improve. That said, and it's pretty obvious uh, from what I've just said, uh, the model, the domain's model, is not a definition of Characterizing welfare is preferred, as I've just said, um, in terms of its key attributes. Now, nor is the five domains model a representation of the body. Uh, it is an aid memoir for helping us think about animal welfare. And I'll be putting up a, um, a slide shortly, which is quite detailed, uh, but which is available as a poster. And basically, it gives a whole lot of examples of different things that we can consider, not to restrict the user to only those, but to give ideas for people to think about it, to work out in terms of the species they've got, or the particular circumstances in which they're operating, um, the sorts of things they can do to manage animal welfare uh, better, or to recognize that they're already doing it pretty well. So it's a focusing device. Uh, it's designed to facilitate systematic, structured, coherent, and comprehensive animal welfare <laughs> assessments. I was looking for more adjectives, but. <laughs> I was also trying to get them all to start with the same letter, but I couldn't, so. Um, not like sort of castration uh, and uh, husbandry procedures that are crushing, <laughs> cautery, constriction. <laughs> I think there are another three C's, but I can't remember them. Um, okay. Oh, yes. Oh, you can just about read that, but you don't need to, all right? The reason I've put that up there is to show you the structure of the model. And you'll see across the top, the, the first three, nutrition, environment, and health, are under the heading of survival-related factors. And behavior is situation-related factors. And then the fifth one, these, all these factors are responsible for generating particular experiences that animals can have. And on the left, for each of those, um, is a negative, uh, negatives and on the right are uh, positives. So key features of the model are that it uh, distinguishes um, between the survival related biological functions, that nutrition, environment and health, and these are the things that actually the five freedoms focused on, though they did talk about behavior as well, um, and that relates to the survival critical stuff. Um, Okay. Uh, now, each of them, as I've said, identifies uh, situation-related environmental enrichment is domain four, um, and that 
relates to sensory inputs from outside the body, so that's where the animal uh, contributes to an animal's perception of its external circumstances. The survival-related um, biological functional things come from inside the body, registering the particular states and balances or imbalances in the body. And they give rise uh, to particular experiences there that are essential for us, uh, that motivate essential survival critical behaviours. Um, and, uh, well, we won't worry too much about that except to say that um, biological function used to be a major focus, was the original focus of animal welfare thinking. What animals experience, their affective state, uh, was also looked at by others and um, these became competing schools. But you can see in the five domains model uh, that these are joined on the understanding that biological function and subjective experiences of animals are dynamically interactive within the animal operating as a whole entity. And so um, you really need to have both in mind when you're thinking about animal welfare. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll just briefly look at uh, a, a number of these. How are we doing for time? Oh, there, right. Um, we didn't start until about... Right, okay, no, that's all right. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is just give you some examples here. Um, again, I'm quite happy to make these slides available, and, and this, this is a poster. I can quite happy to make that available if any of you are interested. Um, so I'm only going to show uh, three of these, and there'll be two of them will be the same as <laughs> the ones we had this afternoon, one will be different. So we'll start with nutrition. Um, and so on the negative side, restrictions on water intake, food intake, food quality, and food variety. Now, quite often we find ourselves in situations, and this is with uh, any animals, where we're just feeding them the same thing over and over and over again. Now, in zoos, for example, it's not uncommon to feed reptiles the same sort of bug that um, they know, they've done the assessments of their mineral content and their um, trace element content and the energy content of them and they know that that's okay uh, because it keeps them alive, okay? That's surviving, all right? Um, and they give them the same thing continuously on a daily basis. Well, they may only feed them on a, uh, at longer intervals, but they get it, no, va no variation at all. And the situation with that is that um, I, well, sorry, um, I think what I should first of all say is, how do you know when a snake is smiling? Okay, that's, that's the question I wanted to ask. How do you know when a snake is smiling? Well, I know when a, uh, a um, Komodo dragon is smiling because it, I had one coming towards me in Perth Zoo a, a couple of years ago, and it reckoned I was dinner and didn't think I could escape. And, uh, but I did actually have the door open behind me ready, ready to go out. Um, but, but it's a serious question in the sense that how do you know if something is really worthwhile, uh, it, it gives a, a, a reptile that doesn't have an expressive face, as far as we know, um, a, a pleasurable experience? And I think the way you go about that is you think, this brings in the natural state orientation, you look at what they do in their natural environment. And I would say, in terms of reptiles, um, it's actually really important to think about their natural environment and start working out how we can improve their situation in, in zoos. Uh, I'm just going to walk over here briefly. being a glasses wearer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hate someone to stand on them. You can start the tape again. <laughs> you can just have a subtitle that is very helpful. <laughs> we can't take this stuff too seriously. Uh, okay. It's not a matter of life and death. It's absolutely much more important than that. Right, so we've got these restrictions Food variety and quality are important. And so we've got the potential negative experiences of thirst, 
hunger, general hunger, salt hunger, and anyone who has livestock where they give them salt licks doesn't need to be advised on that. But there is a specific salt hunger. And uh, without going into a detailed explanation, um, if you get dehydrated and you put a um, teaspoon of salt in water and drink it, it does not taste offensive. Uh, in my terms, it actually tastes quite nice. You know? um, but if you're trying to correct your dehydration, you do actually need to add a teaspoon of sugar because the salt won't be absorbed from the gut unless there is glucose in the gut to drive the pumping mechanisms. And therefore, the salt won't be absorbed and draw the fluid out of the gut to um, sort out your dehydration. Cheers. Um, so, positive opportunities to drink enough water, eat enough food, eat a balanced diet. You need that. You don't want to have deficiencies or excesses. And eat a variety of foods. And also to eat the correct quantities, which is the uh, opposite of uh, uh, voluntary overeating. Um, now, the positive experiences that relate to that are the wetting, quenching pleasures of drinking water. We have the wetting, quenching pleasures of drinking other things on a Friday night. <laughs> uh, pleasures of different tastes and smells, pleasure of the salt taste, masticatory pleasures, which means uh, a pleasure of uh, the, te the textures of the food that you're chewing. And I'm sort of thinking there maybe of rumination in, um, in ruminants. Um, and postprandial satiety, sort of feeling well fed when you've eaten, and then gastrointestinal comfort as opposed to feeling bloated, overfull, and so on. So we'll now look at environment, which is really the close physical environment of animals and tends to relate more to things like indoor environments, but it also um, relates to out outdoor environments. And you can see unavoidable or imposed conditions um, relate to thermal extremes, injurious physical features, injuries from close confinement, atmospheric po pollutants, uh, and then monotony. I um, don't know if you've ever been in some of these sort of eco houses where the temperature stays um, 20 degrees plus or minus 0.5. You can't hear anything that's going on outside because they've got such thick uh, double or triple glazing and the thing is so well insulated. It would drive me barmy. <laughs> and I think if we, we are used to and animals are used to variation in you know, circadian variations. So it's part of how we function. And to have them in pretty well constant environments, if we have got them, uh, that can be a, a, duress, a distressing sort of situation to be in. So the negative experiences are thermal discomfort, uh, that is chilling and hypothermic distress, physical discomfort, including pain, bruises, cuts and fractures, arthritis, skin rashes and things like that, which you we see in pigs, for example. We also see fractures in birds and uh, in cages. Um, now note that there's pain there as well. Um, we'll come back to that in a moment. Respiratory discomfort in terms of infl infl inflammation uh, from um, irritants and also breathlessness, and then malaise from unnatural uh, constancy. Now, there is a thing about this that I'll just mention, and that is that these are not meant to be non-communicating silos, these domains. Um, uh, there's a mention there of pain. In the health area, one of the things, uh, pain derived from, um, uh, where are we, uh, bruises, cuts and fractures and so on, that's as a result of being confined in um, physical, uh, physical restraint, more or less, but, you know. Uh, sour stalls, for example. Um, under health, there is also injury. You think about under health. So the thing is, you don't have to start having arguments. You've got to think about that under health because it's pain and all this sort of thing. It doesn't matter. What you do is you use this as the aid memoir. It helps you to be comprehensive. And if you're thinking about it under environment, and you haven't got the equivalent under health or there are other sorts of pain, you only think about it once, <laughs> you know. Um, this is a flexible 
uh, device, really. And so the sort of things that we um, find in terms of the available conditions are conditions that are thermally toler tolerable, physical hazards are minimal, space for freer movement uh, is available and f uh, fresh air, and then normal environmental variability or some environmental variability. And this gives rise to a whole lot of comforts, and these aren't all of them, thermal, physical, respiratory, and variety related comfort. So we will skip over health because we need to just stick to time. Um, but it's the, uh, it's the same sort of thing here where you have the negatives, the positives, and the experiences in the mental domain. Now we come to the fifth domain, behavior, and I need to just uh, draw your attention to the fact that an animal ex exercises agency <coughs> when it engages in voluntary, self-generated, and goal-directed behaviors. So this is about an animal exercising choice. Um, and many of those behaviors that it chooses to engage in uh, are rewarding and are accompanied by positive experiences, positive affects. Now, in terms of the uh, fourth domain, the negatives are primarily due to the uh, exercise of agency being impeded in some way or other. So you've got invariant, barren environments, ambient, physical, and biotic, constraints on environment-focused activity, that's the sort of thing like exploring and so on. Uh, constraints on animal-to-animal -animal interactivity. We'll talk about those in a minute. Limited sleep and rest, limits on threat avoidance and es escape or defensive activity. And the experiences, anger, frustration, boredom, helplessness, loneliness, depression, withdrawal, unsatisfied sexually, exhaustion, anxiety, fearfulness, panic, and neophobia. And you can see we're getting a long way in terms of large uh, variety of experiences well beyond where the five freedoms were. Um, and then the positives, opportunities to exercise agency via varied, novel, engaging environment, environmental challenges, free movement, exploration, foraging and hunting, uh, or hunting, depending on species, bonding, reaffirming bonds, rearing young, playing, playing, sexual activity, sleeping and resting, using refuges, retreat, or defensive attack. Then positive, calmness, vitality and reward, affectionate sociability, this relates to bonding. I said this afternoon that if I turn to my wife in the morning and say, I'm feeling affectionately sociable, she says, you never tell me you love me. Bang. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you, you can't say animals love each other. <laughs> they, certainly, they certainly bond and they reaffirm bonds. <laughs> and you can see that they certainly have their friends. Uh, and then you've got maternally, maternally or group reward from caring for young, excitation and playfulness, um, sexually gratified, energized, refreshed, secure, protected and confident. So, there are a whole lot of these. And uh, as I move on to uh, the, the next bit, I'll just remark that uh, when I was in uh, one of the positive welfare uh, papers that uh, I wrote uh, as a trilogy, really, in um, New Zealand Veterinary Journal in 2015, when I was looking at the behaviors animals find rewarding, uh, that is, they like them, um, and I was uh, looking up sexual activity in, in animals, I had to quickly cancel connections to a whole lot of websites that came up talking about bestiality. <laughs> but animals enjoy sex, you know. Uh, they really do. And as I said this afternoon, if you need to be convinced about that, YouTube bonobos. Okay, they're the monkeys that just about anything that happens and they engage in sex. And they're obviously doing it because they enjoy it. Uh, there is another point, of course. There are many animals that um, heteros um, uh, many uh, animals that actually will engage in sexual activity completely independently of reproductive purpose. 
You'll get the whole story if you actually read the paper. <laughs> but it's a very small part. <laughs> Oh, I thought it was, yes, well, uh, there's actually quite a lot written on it. Now, if you think, <laughs> if you think about um, the number of affects that were mentioned in the five freedoms, you'll see now that we've moved quite a long way. Okay, so these are affects, these are subjective experiences, negative and positive, that animals in various circumstances may actually be able to experience and by using an awareness of the circumstances, common sense and critical evaluation of behaviour, you can infer cautiously uh, that some of these are present. It's pretty easy with the survival critical stuff um, because breathlessness is easy to identify and the reasons for it are easy to identify. Likewise, thirst, hunger, pain, nausea and things like that. Um, the others are, uh, need to be done uh, really cautiously but without going into a lot of detail now, um, one of the things about the external, externally generated experiences of anxiety, fear and things like that is that we are building our understanding and it's actually um, re really significantly advanced with regard to brain processing that underlies these experiences. And they're sort of increasingly understood in humans. Why? Because they've been studied in animals. So we saying that it's anthropomorphic to suggest that an animal may have a particular experience that humans have when it's actually the mechanisms to understand that in humans have been demonstrated by studying animals seems to me to be a bit of a um, inconsistency. But I think that increasing understanding of um, uh, the brain processing underlying the generation of these experiences uh, actually short circuits the uh, anthropomorphism uh, uh, futile cycle of I'm looking at that animal and I think that doing that means that it's having this experience. That animal is doing the same thing so it must be having that experience with only your supposition. But it's no longer only your supposition. You have the capacity to access the brain processing which supports the conclusion. <clears throat> So we've now arrived at the seven key applications of the model and uh, they are, um, it, it, the model helps us specify key general uh, foci for animal welfare management. I'll explain each of these in a moment. The foundations for specific animal welfare management objectives and the distinction between that I'll <coughs> clarify. Identifies previously unrecognised features of good and poor welfare. Uh, we'll think about that. Enables you to monitor change in animal welfare. Grading of animal welfare compromise and enhancement is possible. Uh, prospective and retrospective animal welfare assessments uh, enabled and quality of life assessments relevant to end of life decisions are facilitated. They're all important. I mean, just go to one, will you? <laughs> this is one. <laughs> the next one will be too. <laughs> okay, so it specifies general foci, focuses, for animal welfare management. And these relate to the targets of the provisions. Good nutrition, good environment, good health, appropriate behaviour. And this is achieved by appropriate or good or knowledgeable application of the provisions uh, achieve, uh, um, uh, uh, of the provisions which um, enable us to achieve welfare relevant outcomes. Um, and I don't really need to go into those, they're absolutely the standard stuff you do when you are managing animals uh, in these respects. We can't measure affect directly, I'm not pretending we can, but by following the provisions we can manage them effectively. Now, um, we have a huge amount of evidence that links uh, particular physiological states and also responses to external circumstances uh, to particular experiences. Um, 
It is our understanding of the experiences animals have and the breadth of them and whether they're negative or positive that will guide um, our application of the provisions. So uh, thinking about good nutrition, environment, health and appropriate behaviour um, motivated by what we understand can be sometimes really negative experiences, sometimes relatively not quite so negative, uh, and what are the opportunities for positive experiences we can achieve with the provisions. Husbandry, veterinary care, facilities, um, and uh, uh, making sure the logistics are there so we don't run out of food and all that sort of thing. Highlights foundations for specific welfare management. Now, you remember I talked about survival cr critical negative experiences, breathlessness, thirst, hunger, etc. Um, now, the objective there, you can't get rid of them, you can't be free of them, uh, but it's to minimize them to low, tolerable levels that still motivate the behaviors that are necessary <coughs> to survive. Um, and the valence, this just means whether they're negative or positive and how intense the negative experience is, or positive, uh, is negative to neutral, it's in that range. The other ones, uh, situation-related negative experiences, the objective is to replace them as far as is possible or practical with situation-related positive experiences via enrichments and the valence of those ones is also negative to neutral. They're wanting to get rid of us. <laughs> um, and then finally, the situation related positive experiences. Um, the way our objective there is to provide animals with opportunities to engage in the behaviors that will to enable them to have comfort, pleasure, interest, confidence, and a sense of being in control. That's in general. And the valence of them is neutral to positive. So this is a way of looking at it. You can see the survival critical negative experiences related to internal imbalances or disruptions, and we've gone into them, breathlessness, thirst, hunger, etc. Situation related negative experiences, threatening, barren, restricted or isolation in environments, anxiety, fear, panic, etc. They operate in the negative to neutral range. And then the situation-related positives related to safe, stimulus-rich, spacious environments with companions, if they are um, social species, um, we have all of these as well, okay? I'll deal with the inhibit shortly. Now, there is a, so it also helps to identify uh, previously unrecognized features of poor uh, and good welfare. And you can already see, I think, how that happens. Because, because we now understand that so many of these particular experiences, the wide variety of experiences, um, are what animals can have, then what that, uh, and we also understand what gives rise to them, um, what, what it does is if you are still locked into the standard way of talking about uh, animal uh, negative animal experiences, you're talking about pain and suffering or pain and distress um, or pain and some sort of harm, um, uh, what, what tends to happen is people focus on the pain. And if there's no pain, they don't think there's a welfare problem. Uh, an example recently is um, where uh, my colleague Nio Beausoleil was talking to a veterinarian uh, who was talking about brachycephalic dogs um, which, um, and this particular one was, uh, res had quite significant respiratory compromise. And he said, but it's not in pain, so there's not a problem, is there? Okay. The fact that it, uh, its tongue was hanging out, was <laughs> <laughs> that's a good Im imitation, isn't it? <laughs> Brachycephalic dog. Um, but uh, to complete the thing, I have to fall on the floor unconscious, but I'm not going to do that um, because I'll have run out uh, when it runs out of oxygen. Um, waking up many times in the night because they uh, end up with hypoxic um, episodes, um, exercise intolerant, um, need to um, uh, 
have um, a, a range of surgeries and so on uh, with regard to anything that requires um, uh, 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 increased breathing. Thermoregulation, of course, dogs um, manage their uh, heat dissipation through uh, panting and if that is seriously compromised. So um, uh, I hope I'm not treading on anyone's toes. Actually, I don't mind if I'm treading on anyone's toes. I very strongly like to dissuade people from getting brachycephalic dogs or cats or rabbits um, because uh, unless they are the ones that are hardly affected at all, and there are some that aren't that badly affected, they will spend most of their life in uh, serious uh, states of breathlessness. And I don't think we really want that. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, a bit of a sidebar to the fact that knowing about breathlessness, nausea, um, uh, anxiety, uh, boredom and so on actually widens the, the areas of consideration when you're thinking about welfare rather than saying, oh well, it's only pain really and the other stuff we don't really know about. What I'm saying is the other stuff, take pain off it and you've got that very long list. Um, and we also add to that now the um, the positives. So the model is much more specific with regard to negative affects and you can see much more specific than just pain and uh, suffering or pain and distress. Um, and the model also is very specific about positive affects and you can see them here. Uh, and this specificity enables more precise targeting. Uh, via the provisions to correct particular welfare compromises and to promote particular welfare enhancements. The fourth, well, this is pretty obvious, uh, enables monitoring of responses to specific welfare focus, focused remedial actions, uh, interventions and or maintenance activities and you just do that by doing a five domains assessment now and then you do that and then you do another one and then you might do another one and you compare the outcomes. So it's just repeated use of it uh, to see whether or not what you're doing is uh, working or that good situations are being maintained or whether or not things are going downhill. Whoops, sorry. Okay, and it also allows uh, qualitative grading of particular features of welfare compromise and or enhancement and there's a five tier welfare um, uh, compromise scale. Um, I did sort of show a seven tier version of it but um, that was sort of a special case and what I mentioned there is just because there are five tiers here doesn't mean you use five tiers for everything. Um, it may be that in certain circumstances with particular experiences, all you can differentiate is things are okay or they're really bad. Uh, you may be in the situation where you have no compromise, mild compromise and um, severe compromise. Uh, so you don't have to use the whole scale uh, and you should be um, uh, prudent and uh, use your common sense on whether or not you do. Research, teaching and testing, it's pretty easy to, because you've got so much information about those animals, um, it's pretty easy to use the five point scale. Uh, in other circumstances, um, you probably wouldn't. In terms of the four tier enhancement scale, this relates to the use of opportunities to engage in rewarding behaviours. And uh, so there's none, low level, medium level and high level. And the thing about that is there's nothing absolute in this. Um, you would probably say, well, I've, I've come to this particular way of managing animals. Let's say we're talking about layer hens um, and uh, they're in normal, what are called battery cages. Um, and uh, then what you do is you put them into colony cages, which are much bigger, higher, um, uh, higher roof to them. Well, not roof, but you know, the, the top of it is uh, further away from the bottom. <laughs> Jet lag's kicking in. <laughs> I'm sure I could find some more words to to explain something really simple. Um, and uh, so you you have perches. 
dust bathing, nest boxes, scratch pads, and plenty of room. And in terms of our code of welfare in New Zealand now for layer hens, it's expressed in terms of what behaviours the birds must be able to do rather than how big it is and uh, re restricting the size and all that sort of thing uh, and the, the number given the size. Um, now, under those circumstances, just as an example, if there were only scratch pads, you'd probably put in low level. If there were scratch pads and um, uh, perches, you might put in a medium level. And if you had all of them, you might put in a high level. Uh, but it is, it, there's nothing sort of absolute about this, uh, but it does give you an indication to uh, help you gauge how well improvements are going. And it's something that um, those who own and look after the animals can uh, do themselves. Nearly there. Enable both prospective and retrospective animal welfare assessments to be conducted. And the prospective ones uh, where we anticipate the negative or positive um, welfare outcomes of doing something different. For example, devising a new zoo and aquarium enrichments, changing in husbandry housing of farm working and sports animals, evaluating pest control devices, tools and procedures, that's prospective, uh, and also evaluating research, teaching and testing procedures. And just to mention that the five domains model has been used for the last 20 years in New Zealand as a requirement of all people applying for animal ethics committee approval for research, teaching and testing, that it has to be used uh, in order to gauge the negative impacts of anything they might be doing, and if there are any to uh, uh, outline positive impacts. And then retrospective applications uh, to situations uh, that have occurred, and of course that's all of the above once you've done them. Uh, and then forensic use uh, f to prepare expert opinions or expert witness statements in cruelty cases. Now this is an example of um, an innovative Canadian-based uh, animal behavior person, uh, Rebecca Ledger, some of you might know of her. Um, she has uh, used the science underlying the five domains model, um, but also in some cases the five domains model, to form the basis of expert opinions in cruelty cases where she has been able to demonstrate to judges, who are the important people really <laughs> in the, these things, uh, that animals are having negative experiences and being able to be convincing in showing that from the evidence available, it is a reasonable conclusion to arrive at. Um, I've, uh, for a long time, I've been talking to veterinarians who are saying, look, so often we, th we know that there's something really seriously wrong, um, but we can't get it across in court cases because they obsess, they're obsessed with physical evidence and, um, and they distrust behavioral evidence. And what Rebecca has done is to uh, use our current knowledge to mount very convincing arguments um, that uh, particular experiences uh, that are negative uh, have been generated by whatever has happened to the animals. And she's been successful with a lot of, um, in, in case. Um, and Australia and in June, and uh, she spoke to ministry people and SPCA's um, uh, research people, uh, lawyers, Crown Law Office and, and so on in New Zealand and the equivalent in Australia. And they were all blown away by the advance that this allows. One of the things that she has said is that it's really important not to sort of suddenly see the five domains model, think it's the best thing since sliced bread and rush in to in every case to try and find 30 things that were wrong. You know, um, it's actually, we're in the early days, it's really important to go for cases that can be won um, and uh, to pick on things that are really straightforward to support. Because what we don't want at this stage is for judges to come down with negative views on this which would set back uh, this development. And I'll be working with uh, Rebecca to write a
paper on the uh, forensic use of the five domains model um, to assist with that. And then finally, provide adjunct information to support quality of life evaluations in the context of end of life decisions. Now, one of the problems with the way we look at quality of life is we have a tendency to think, yeah, okay, we can get a good handle on quality of life. Look, you're grading negatives and you're grading positives and surely we just put those together and you've got the answer. Well, unfortunately, it's not, not that straightforward. In fact, it's very, um, uh, very complicated. Um, and just one thing that works against that is that there's a different basis for grading negatives and for grading the positives. So you can't actually put them together and say that they balance out. However, um, quality of life is a useful concept because it indicates that animals do have positive and negative experiences. Um, it uh, gives focus on the animal as a whole um, and we can get somewhere with it. For example, um, the survival Oh, that's what I'm doing. OK. Um, the uh, survival critical experiences, breathlessness, thirst, hunger, pain, etc., when they are significant, even if the opportunities are available for animals to engage in behaviors that will give rise to some of these, they don't. OK. So if you know that animals have been using uh, opportunities are there for them to engage in rewarding behaviors and then something goes wrong and you know that some of these experiences are likely to be uh, present and you find that they're not using those opportunities that they used to, that would give you uh, information that may lead you to a decision to euthanize. If on the other hand, uh, animals are in a situation where some of those experiences may be, uh, this survival critical stuff may be occurring, but with encouragement or spontaneously, they are still engaging in behaviors that they're finding rewarding at sufficient frequency for you to be able to say, well, yeah, it's, it's pretty good, really. Um, then that may help you to a decision to defer euthanasia. So it can be uh, quite useful from that point of view. Question, is the minimalist aim of mere survival sufficient? Well, I think you've got my answer. Um, the biological functioning approach focus, focused on survival related factors. Um, uh, sorry. The biological functional approach focused on survival related factors can achieve survival but this will usually only minimize uh, or neutralize negative affective states. Um, you'll never actually get rid of them. Nevertheless, it's really important to do that for the reason I've just explained. How can survival be accompanied by a good quality of life? By identifying positive affective experiences that animals may have and by providing them with opportunities to have those experiences. How can such positive experiences be identified? Well, an example is via illustrations that are part of the five domains model. Okay? Ta da. <laughs> so, uh, now, they are examples, and I really want to emphasize that. It's a thing to stimulate people to think. And actually, what's interesting is that in zoos, they are really, once they get it, once they understand how the model works, they're really uh, infused to think of other ways of enhancing the experience of the animals in their institutions. How can the 2015 model be used to improve quality of life? So this is giving you some advice on that. First, consider the potential positive effects that are known to be aligned with survival related and situation related factors. Second, for each domain, assess whether the circumstances would impede or allow animals to have positive or rewarding experiences. Third, seek to introduce and or maintain beneficial circumstances, recognizing that once they are in existence, they are enrichments. And I'm using that to mean 
um, in terms of what the situation was before, not in any absolute sense. So you made things better, but not necessarily perfect, if you see what I mean. So what questions would support enrichment initiatives? What opportunities have been provided for the animal's comfort, pleasure, interest, confidence, choice, and challenge? What provisions have been made to ensure that consuming food, provide, the food provided will be a pleasurable experience? What will, what will expression, how will expressions of normal behavior be encouraged and harmless wants met? Now, the harmless wants met relates to Labradors that will just go on eating until they're sort of tubs of lard, okay? And that's not harmless for them and they have no self-control. A bit like me when I'm traveling. I've, my belt has gone out several notches since I started on the 4th of October. Only the 4th of October. Um, I've been too well looked after in terms of the wonderful food and hospitality and so on. It's been marvelous. Um, what environmental choices will be available that will encourage exploratory and food acquisition activities that are rewarding? Animals like exploring if they are in uh, stimulus-rich environments. And you can think of just about any animal and you will see how much they do. There's an absolutely wonderful um, uh, YouTube video that I recommend to you, which is uh, Manuel Birdoy. Manuel B E R D O Y, I think it is. Anyway, if you Manuel Birdoy, anything that approximate, approximates to that, rats released in, uh, into the wild in Oxford. Okay, and that'll bring up a study, a 25-minute um, uh, film of releasing albino rats that have been in the laboratory for generations into a wild area. Okay. And uh, it just shows you the way they adapt to that, uh, develop nests and tunnels and all sorts of things, and learn uh, about uh, predators. <laughs> um, <laughs> the way I describe this is um, uh, if, if you look at wild rats and they want to go from here to there, they come to the burrow's entrance, and they sort of look like this, and then they go like the clappers straight to where they're going uh, to be undercover again. My um, miming of what the white rats did, the lab rats did when they were first released was they sort of come out and say, hmm, right. Yeah, oh, <laughs> And uh, I imagine sort of aerial predators thought it was dinner time, but um, they very quickly learn uh, and start behaving like wild rats. But they really enjoy um, exploration. Think about pigs rooting. Think about hens uh, in um, gardens. Uh, we had a whole lot of hens that my wife wanted and they laid waste the garden because they were so interested in exploring and feeding at the same time. Um, what provisions have been made to enable social species to engage in bonding and bond affirming activities and as appropriate other affiliative interactions such as maternal, paternal, and paternal and group care of young, play behavior and sexual activity? And finally, let us be clear. It's not possible to completely eliminate all of the negative experiences that animals may have. We're not talking about putting animals into a nirvana-like bliss, perpetual bliss state, okay? We're talking about being realistic here. But it is possible to minimize them and it is also possible to replace some situation-related negative affects with positive ones using enrichments. Mental cruelty. 
Yeah. Um, is there a way that that you define that or can measure that? Um, yeah, uh, that was uh, that's actually really good. Um, you're obviously reading my slides. <laughs> that's the sort of thing that was in legislation. And the point of that was to say, well, we don't really know what the particular constituents of this are, but we have this sense. Um, uh, uh, we need a catch-all for negative experiences. And so that was just one of them. So you have distress, suffering, mental cruelty, uh, and that sort of thing. And what I've tried to do is to say, if we're going to make progress, we need to be able to identify what the particular experiences are that would fall under that category, because it was usually pain and mental cruelty, suffering, distress, only one of those. So it's a generic term meaning really nasty experiences, and the mental identifies that it's actually something that animals experience. Okay, so you... And then, and then you have to interpret that. Your OSPCA, then you, it's your... So this would be a tool you could use to help um, actually interpret that. Because the other thing the, is... The, leg the, the legislation regulation is very vague. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the point is we think pain is uh, a, a, a um, very specific term. It's not. There are about 30 different sorts of pain. Suffering is a generic term for it's really awful. And a lot of people sort of had this sense that if you were in serious pain, um, somehow when it's really unremitting, you're suffering, actually, you're still in serious pain. But the general state of um, abject, uh, <laughs> uh, unpleasant experience is called suffering. Just the same way serious breathlessness is a very unpleasant experience. And that doesn't turn into suffering. It just gets more and more serious. But all of these at the extreme are regarded as serious suffering, mental cruelty, distress, these sorts of things. No, okay. no, because uh, breathlessness isn't painful. Yeah. Nausea isn't painful. They are objectionable and really unpleasant um, subjective experiences. And so, um, but the, the reason they used to put pain and suffering was they recognized that pain wasn't the only negative thing, but you remember the comments about the uh, uh, fundamentalist puritanical um, behaviorists. Um, and that limiting the number of ex experiences that we could talk about in animals because they didn't think you could really um, un uh, understand or um, be accurate in your description about negative experiences animals could have. Um, and so they put in suffering or distress or mental cruelty as generic terms to accommodate these. Uh, but I think we need now to be much more specific and that helps us to focus. If you've got breathlessness, you obviously have to focus on uh, respiratory discomfort or the fact that someone is seeing someone just blows them away. Oh. <laughs> David. <laughs> Not David Mellor, David, uh, that'll do. <laughs> you talk about constant environments being distressing. Well, um, I think I wouldn't sort of, I think we're talking about malaise there rather than distress. Um, Malaise is a general sense of boredom and um, uh, weakness and innovation and things like that. Um, and I think we are built, and so are animals, to deal with variation in our day. Um, and if we keep animals in constant conditions, uh, then after a, a period, that is potentially aversive. So, I mean, that's a fairly speculative one, but it's to stimulate people to think about it. Yes? Sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to speak up. Sorry, okay. Um, when he 
came to invariant environments, you mentioned um, the biotic environment. Yep. And I just didn't fully understand what Okay, biotic is just um, soil, plants, animals, uh, and so on, as opposed to the meteorological environment, which is the air, rain, snow, all that sort of stuff. Okay. I have a question about yeah, applying the domains model. So you have um, uh, a scale for looking at negative aspects yep. and then a scale for enhancements. Yep. So has the, for the model actually been turned into, uh, say, like an audit for particular situations? Mm. Is that what's being used for the, the lab animal situation or animal situation? Um, in that's system? actually primarily used for looking at particular experiments with regard to okay. research, teaching, and testing. So you've got your defined circumstances, right. and you evaluate the impact, likely impact, and also what you're going to do to the animal. Right. You have your likely impact on the animal, which you can pardon me, thoroughly explore with the so model. So it's a relative scale. You can yeah, oh yes, it's all relative. To another, yeah, yeah. But you don't know, there isn't a score that you could say, okay, this is acceptable, this is not. We specifically, we specifically uh, have uh, avoided using a numerical score because it implies a precision that you can't get. I mean, some circumstances, you can, as I was just saying, uh, uh, you can, it's just, you've, things are okay or they're really bad and that's about all you can say about some things. Other things you can place minor, middle, serious. Others you can be in a bit more detail. Um, yeah. You're just trying to compete with my 150 years. Yes. <laughs> They'll just score it down to just below the level of whatever you're, you're, you've assessed as too much. So in other words, if you said 47 is too much, they'll make sure that they're 45. So, you know, like, so there's no point. In, in my opinion, I would never go for any kind of scoring because what it does, I think, is it ends discussion. You yep. need to have people exploring yep. and allowing themselves to say, yeah, that's going to be real shitty in that area. But then we all, you know, that, and it allows you to keep talking. Absolutely. Absolutely right. We didn't use quite those words, but we made exactly, <laughs> the same, exactly the same point in the publication. And I really wish I sort of could have quoted you. I mean, it, it's, no, no. I mean, it does cut off discussion, and the whole point is exercising cautious, scientific, uh, sci scientifically supported best judgment. And uh, eventually you sort of build up a consensus over a period. Uh, we have our, we've only got 57 ethics committees in New Zealand, um, and that might seem like a lot, but it isn't. Um, uh, and uh, we all talk to each other, um, and the ministry talks to them, and the ANSCART um, uh, talks to them, and they share experiences. There's no sort of sense of trying to regularise things across the whole country, but I like the idea of having an indication of the sort of scores that you would give particular things and having that available for uh, other ethics committees. Yes. Yeah. We're talking about very subjective experiences. Yep. So how, or how is it supposed to be like generalized for all different animals and to be used by all different levels of people if it's so subjective? You've put your finger on it. Uh, <laughs> no, the situation, the situation is that you need to have people who understand the uh, biology, ecology, and behavior of the animals you're dealing with. That's really important. This is just a whole lot of examples to get people to think. So uh, that may be applicable to many mammals, um, and uh, n uh, much of it may not be applicable to birds. But if anything in there stimulates people to look at birds in a different way, if it stimulates people to look at some mammals in a different way, um, and what's happening in zoos is they're even looking at spiders, believe it or not. Um, and uh, reptiles and fish and, and so on. And um, they actually, um, yeah. Um, spiders? Hmm? Spiders. Spiders, <laughs> yep. Um, tarantulas. Favourite. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, 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 yeah. Hairy. I don't like them. Um, yeah, so it's really important to be specific for the species. Yes, there is this thing of um, uh, people think it's subjective, but the point that I'm making is you can only ascribe or infer an experience if you can justify it. And you may uh, just be in the situation where all you say is, I don't know what the particular negative experience is, but the demeanor of this animal in this circumstance really looks as if it's, uh, it's getting negative affects. Don't know what they are, uh, but that gives you a sense of saying, well, it's gone from maybe neutral to some sort of negative state, that sort of thing. So um, there's quite a lot of specificity here, but it must be cautiously employed um, and you need people who understand the species. And that's sometimes difficult for ethics committees that have a very wide compass uh, in terms of the animals they're dealing with. <coughs> well, thank you very much for that. Um, great, great. <laughs> tomorrow, we've, worked, we've put David to work a lot this week, and tomorrow is a seminar at noon, and it's here. And it is. Oh, it's uh, yeah. And yeah. Okay. It's okay. the um, onset of um, uh, particular. Yeah. It's the onset of flexible behaviours after birth in three groups of mammals, being neurologically very immature, neurologically moderately immature, neurologically mature, and how we understand uh, that the. Um, Cognitive input, that is um, thinking through the cerebral cortex, gets involved in that. And there is a thing that we'd be able to discuss after it, um, uh, and that is the question of fetal consciousness. Um, because the understanding of this leads to uh, an understanding of whether or not fetuses are, are conscious. And I'll leave that hanging in the air. <laughs> yes. But it usually generates quite a lot of discussion. So that's going to be in this room tomorrow, 12.30. And uh, there'll be a meet and greet after that. So uh, thank you, everyone, for coming and sharing your evening and uh, joining one more time. Thank you. Thank you.